Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. This week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while because it's really unusual uh, to have the two of us on these sides of uh, the microphone. Uh, we have with me today Jake Tapper, who is, of course, an American journalist. He's an author. He's a cartoonist uh, as well, which I hope we get to, to mention. He's the lead Washington anchor for CNN. He hosts the weekday television news show, The Lead, with Jake Tapper and co-hosts the Sunday morning uh, show, uh, State of the Union. And he also, as you might can see if you're watching this on YouTube, in his uh, background, he and I share a love for defeated presidential <laughs> candidates. And he has, he has the, the signs all up. And that's, those are my favorite uh, biographies as well. But Jake is the author of a new book, and it's, it's a political thriller uh, called All the Demons Are Here. Jake Tapper, welcome Thank to The Thank you Russell so much, Moore Russell. Show. It's great to be here. As you know, uh, I'm a big fan of you and your work uh, and your integrity, and it's, uh, it's nice to talk to you. Well, likewise, I, I'm just wondering, you know, I'm, I'm about midway through your book and I'm, I'm wondering as I'm reading it, how on earth do you manage to write a book? There are characters it spans all through uh, American social history, political history, and is a thriller, murder mystery, everything else. How do you find the time to do that? when you're hosting a show every day and and on the weekend as well. I mean, do you have just a killer set of time management skills to be able to pull this I, off? I, I guess so. I mean, what I do is when I'm in the middle of a writing project, I have a very specific way of going about it. I do an outline and I get feedback on the outline and I fill in a lot of the blanks of the outline and then I chop it up into chapters. And then I make a point of writing every day for at least 15 minutes a day, because everybody uh, has 15 minutes in their schedule uh, that day. You know, you can do it over breakfast. You can do it over lunch. You can do it right before you go to bed, even if you have a busy day. And if that's all you do by the end of the week, you, that's an hour 45. That's at least two or three pages. I guess so. I mean, yeah. I, I, I just am very focused. I have to say writing these books is a lot of fun for me. I mean, it is work, but it's a yeah. it's joyous. It's a good escape for me from some of the stress of my job. It's a good escape for me from some of the more depressing parts of my job, covering war, covering mass shootings and the like. The latest one, uh, All the mm -hmm. Demons Are Here, takes place in 1977. And that's a wild year. I was only yeah. eight, so I didn't remember a lot of it. But going back and, and researching and seeing all the crazy stuff that was going on with Evil Knievel, the superstar yeah. stuntman and Elvis dying and Studio 54 opening and the New York City blackout and the Son of Sam murders and the rise of tabloid journalism in New York. You had people joining cults, people seeing UFOs all over the country. I mean, it was just a wild year. So learning about it, writing about it was honestly a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I, as you're as you're moving through the book and and all of these these characters and features show up, I thought to myself at one point, wow, there's a lot of dark themes coming in here, even though the book itself is not dark in terms of the way it's written. But then I thought, well, 1970s, that, that was it a was. dark time. People were very disillusioned <laughs> with the United States. I mean, the one-two punch of the Vietnam War and Watergate and the lies that our leaders, um, Richard Nixon and all the president's men and all the generals, the lies that they were exposed to have been telling the public were depressing and people were upset. And the main one, I have two main characters in the book, Lucy and Ike. Lucy is an aspiring reporter and she's 22. Ike is her little brother. He's 20. He's an AWOL Marine. They're the kids of the main characters from my two previous books. And Ike is a stand-in for all of us, feeling disillusioned, not understanding the lies, not understanding the, the glibness with which um, leaders sent he and his 
fellow service members into battle. And I feel like we're kind of in a period like that today as well, a real disillusionment and mistrust of, of power. And isn't it true? To, I mean, when you think about, for instance, I'm not going to give any spoilers uh, here for people who are going to read the book, but the role that evil can evil yeah. plays. I mean, th there are there are times when I think if I had read this book 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I would have thought, oh, well, that's kind of a fantastic piece coming in here. But now, I mean, don't you every day when you're on your show, aren't there times when you think, I can't believe yeah. this is happening? All the time. I can't believe that I would have never predicted. Yeah, well, it's yeah. A, so the, the, I think the spoiler alert you're referring to is I have uh, Evil Knievel launch a, a stunt presidential campaign. He runs for president. Uh, and it's really just a stunt, but it's a way to talk about followers and leaders and rhetoric and mobs and, and the like. And it was fun to play with. And and there is a, a through line, a DNA, a showmanship, a salesmanship DNA that P.T. Barnum, Evil Knievel, uh, and and Donald Trump all had, and, and I don't mean it in a pejorative way. They have all three of them have an ability right. to get attention, uh, which is no small thing. Any politician would love to have that ability, the ability to make news, the ability to to get followers and supporters. Yeah, but sometimes I'll be watching the news or watching speeches, and I'll just not be able to understand. The, like I would, I think just as somebody who like my journalism is my full time job, but I, you know I dabble in, in fiction. And there are times that I'm covering something that I'll think, well, if I tried to do this as a fiction writer, nobody would believe yeah. it. Like, just a, this is just a recent and very small example. Marjorie Taylor Greene gave a speech, a very conservative congresswoman from Georgia, gave a speech railing against Biden. But the way she went about attacking Biden largely was something that Joe Biden loved. I mean, and in fact, Joe Biden took yeah. her because she was like, he's trying to continue in the vein of FDR and LBJ, and he wants to provide health care and education. And I mean, it was just, Joe Biden could have written, you know, 75% of her remarks. And it was just really remarkable just in terms of how she speaks. I, I, I understand what she was trying to say. She was trying to say, yeah, yeah. government's too big. FDR made it too big. LBJ made it too big. We don't want federal control of education. We don't want federal control of this and that. You know, I, I get it. I know where she's coming from, but she's so in her own bubble. Uh, and this is one of the problems in American society today is everybody's in their bubble. She's so in her own bubble that she didn't, like the choir to whom she was preaching understood what she was saying. But the, you know, 70% yeah. of the rest of us listening to her say, you know, that sounds pretty good, <laughs> you know, there's yeah, somebody wanting yeah. to make achievements in education. We need achievements in education. I, again, I know where she was coming from, but still. Well, you know, I think there was a time maybe in 2021 early on when a lot of us thought, well, maybe we're moving into a boring right. time now. And, and, and meaning that is a good thing. Pandemic wrapping up, the Trump era over, and that this was going to be kind of a placid sort of time. Well, That's first of all, happening. people thought is that it? Trump was going to go away, which I never yeah. thought. And obviously, given all the investigations and now indictments into his behavior, all the accountability, that obviously means that Mr. Trump has not disappeared, even if he had wanted to disappear. But he doesn't want to disappear. Mm -hmm. He loves the attention. He's a showman. But then also, like, you know, the public is, I mean, the, the nation is going through something of a, a readjustment. I mean, some of it has to do with technology, like the way that we consume information. Everything is changing how we read books, how we watch TV, how we get the news. And then in addition to technology changing, there are, you know, people are, I think, increasingly going into their silos when it comes to only wanting to hear from people with whom they agree. And so you have, yeah. you know, media organizations making business decisions based on, well, let's just get our, let's just, I'm, we're just preaching to the choir, so let's just get 100% share of the choir. And then yeah. our yeah. politics is getting, in some ways, more divided. I mean, if you look at the, bipartisan achievements of the Congress. Actually, the last couple of years have been pretty good in terms of bipartisan achievements, but there is a, a tremendous amount of polarization that has to do with all sorts of things, including gerrymandering and fewer competitive house seats and the like. You talk about these, uh, these silos. Uh, one of the questions I get all the time from Christians, and I'm talking about the, the mainstream Christians who really do want to get past all of this polarization is to say, how do I know 
what's true and what's false. I mean, you, you think about the way the fake news uh, language has been transformed in the past several years, but people are saying, how do I know if a source that I'm looking at is reliable, trustworthy? It doesn't mean that it's, it's perfect, but that it's not propaganda. Is there, is there a way that you could help somebody it's to a, determine it's a, it's a great question. I mean, the, the glib answer would be just watch my show. I'm, 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 I'm good. You can trust me. <laughs> but but the, the real answer is you need to be a consumer, a, a sophisticated consumer of, of news and information. And that means multiple sources. And that means if there are sources that only ever report things that are favorable to one political party or the other, those are ones you should probably wonder about. I mean, if you watch a channel mm. in which Joe Biden do, does no wrong or a channel in which Donald Trump does no wrong, you're probably not getting the full story because there is no politician that blemishless, that blemish free. But I, I find that I consume a lot of different news from a lot of different sources and from a diversity. And by diversity, I mean diversity in every way, not just mm -hmm. racial or or, or ideological even, but also just what about religion? What about people who are spiritual? Uh, what are their views? What about foreign policy? Mm -hmm. What about geographic diversity? What about, am I reading about what people on the very progressive side of the aisle think? Not, not Democrats, capital D Democrats, but people who think Joe, Joe Biden is, is too corporate for their liking. What about people who are populist yeah. on the right and, and their views? And I think when you get a really good steady diet of information from lots of sources, you get a pretty good idea of who can be relied upon for news, who can be relied upon for intellectually honest opinion, which is very important because mm -hmm. if you have opinion, but they're not intellectually honest, they're only sharing with you some information, they're leaving out other information, then that's a source you shouldn't trust. So. I think the, the, the wider array of a diet, the more diverse the diet, the, the better and smarter news consumer you can become. I heard you in an interview, I think it was on NPR, in which the question was, if in the middle of the oh, lead, yeah. Donald Trump called in and said, I want to talk, would you have him on or, or not? And you, you kind of wrestled <laughs> with that for, for a minute or so. And I wonder how, how do you make those decisions? And the, the reason I ask that is because I don't think that's just something for television journalists. Preachers deal with this all the time. How do I, how do I keep from simply giving myself over to the sensational when everybody else around me is trying to do the sensational and the outrageous? How do you check yourself while at the same time a uh, presidential candidate, former president calling in in the middle of the show? That yeah. is newsworthy. Scott Simon right. really put you. I mean, you heard me wrestling uh, with it because it was I, he did put me on the spot. It wasn't like a knee jerk answer. I ended up arriving at I guess my inclination is to put him on air live. But with the you know, but I always reserve the, the, the right to end the interview. But, you know, it is also true that Donald Trump says things, a lot of things that are not true. And also that he says reckless things that have been shown to in the past uh, incite violence. And so you have to consider that when when airing anything of his life, which again, is not to say no, it just is something you have to think about. I'm of course named Jacob and Jacob wrestled with an angel and I'd spent a lot of my days mm -hmm. wrestling with a lot of these issues. And generally speaking, I don't do it alone. I have an amazing staff and a diverse slate of, of people in my inner circle and we all, you know, every anchor and every show makes decisions for themselves. Uh, but I have a, a bunch of people and we talk about these things. How do we want to go about doing this? What is the purpose we want to do? What are their competing considerations? How do we, you know, even just so I interviewed Governor DeSantis and mm -hmm. before the interview, the news about Donald Trump broke the news that he had been alerted from Jack Smith, the special counsel, that he was likely going to be indicted, that he'd gotten a, a, a he was told he was a, a target of an investigation and uh, he would likely be indicted. And we had a conversation with several people on my staff, executives at CNN. OK, I have to ask Governor DeSantis about this. Where do we put it in the interview? How do we ask about it? How many questions? Like we think a lot about this stuff. And, you know, when I'm live on air, it's often just me making a decision in the split in a split second. But in a perfect world, we can make these we can have these discussions during a commercial break 
or somebody says, well, we, somebody says in my ear, well, we think X, Y, Z, what do you think? And I can go like this on air and nobody knows that I'm nodding to the, to the, to my executive producer, but it's better if it's a, if it's a consensus discussion at the very least. What, what about the role of religion? in American life right now. I mean, one of the interesting things that I've seen just in the past couple of weeks, there was a a family forum, social conservatives, evangelicals in Iowa, featuring uh, presidential candidates. Tucker Carlson uh, was the one chosen to do the moderating. Most of the questions and the crowd enthusiasm, they weren't about the typical religious right Uh, sorts of issues. They were about uh, anti-Ukraine, pro-Russia sort of language. That was the red meat being thrown out. And a figure such as Mike Pence not receiving a lot of enthusiasm in that room. Have we reached the point where the religious right is kind of gone as a relevant factor when it comes to setting the agenda Uh. of the issues? It's such a complicated question, and of course, I don't, I don't speak for the religious right, but I will say I have been covering politics. This will be my seventh presidential election, and I've been covering politics for a long time. And I remember there, uh, there was an Iowa Family, Faith, and Freedom Forum in 1999 that I attended as a reporter. It's where I met Jeff Zeleny, who is now a colleague here at CNN, but at the time he was with the Des Moines Register. And what they were talking about was abortion, gay rights, uh, and I think pornography. I think those were the three, as I recall, those were the three topics that they were most interested in. Again, I'm going by memory. And that made a certain sense to me at the time, you know, that these are, these are very, these are social issues that are important uh, to these individuals who are conservative evangelical Christians uh, and who care deeply about the Bible and about faith and the like. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm Jewish. I have a different faith tradition, but I, 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 you know, one of the things about being somebody of faith and of, of a minority religion is that you, um, well, at least I, uh, come to, I come to the table when it comes to religion as, as having an open mind in terms of respecting faith and, and understanding people have different points of view and the like. And that made more sense to me. And I, I, I guess that, and I know you've lived through this much more than I have, but I guess the way that evangelical conservative leaders have embraced Donald Trump, who I don't think it's unkind to say it does not have a particularly strong faith tradition in his personal life, but certainly delivered on a lot of promises that evangelical conservatives cared deeply about, such as the, the U.S. Supreme Court and, and eventual overturning of Roe v. Wade. I've, I have found it interesting and also sometimes difficult to understand. And not unlike, it's, it's not a direct parallel, but, it's, it, but not unlike the way I found feminist leaders in the 90s embrace of Bill Clinton similarly confounding. I got that he delivered laws and priorities, policy priorities to professional feminists and and those who identified as feminists, but also like his personal treatment of women. It, it, it seemed like something that was overlooked in a way that I didn't fully understand. And that's how that I think that's how yeah. I, I kind of view the evangelical conservative political community embrace of Donald Trump. I don't fully understand it. Is there really no compunction here about how this individual has lived his life? Because I'm look, I'm not running around telling people to that that I'm I'm holier than now or I'm some paragon of virtue. But I mean, <laughs> I've certainly lived yeah, a life of yeah. more virtue uh, than certain others. Wait, I mean, you, you look around at how 2016, 2020, so many churches divided, so many families divided, their friendships of 25, 30 years that are yeah. gone uh, as a result of this political moment. Do you think 2024 is going to be like that? Or have we already uh, kind of burned over and, and sorted out in ways that this will be almost, if not routine, have, have we become numb to all the division? I don't. No, I think it's going to be worse. I do. You and do. I'll tell you why. I, I, I think it's going to be worse because of some of these, because I think the social issues are, are really front and center in a way that they weren't even necessarily 
in 2016 or 2020, be, you know, the, the, the trans issue is really mm -hmm. uh, one that conservatives uh, and progressives talk quite a bit about and that is very divisive. And while I think there is room for a nuanced conversation of on athletics, you know, it's an, I, I'm just giving, I'm, this is not, I'm not giving a personal view here. I'm saying this is, this is a nuanced right. middle ground that I think probably a lot of people could, could get together on like, you know, along the lines of when it comes to competitive girls at, or women's athletics, these rules really should be in place just for fairness to the girls and women because we care about girls and women achieving the society. But everybody should be able to live in, in dignity uh, and with compassion. And, you know, we are all God's children, et cetera. Like there is, there is something there, but that's not how this yeah. is being discussed. And then, you know, longer have, you know, there used to be in our politics kind of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink by, by Republicans that, Yes, we want to overturn Roe v. Wade, but like, wink, wink, it's never going to happen. Don't worry about it. This shouldn't be a motivating force because mm -hmm. Republicans knew that, generally speaking, the public, according to polling, supports abortion rights. They might support some restrictions, but they support abortion rights in general. They think it's a personal decision that people should be able to make. But that is gone because of the Dobbs decision. So now that is actually prominent. I think it's going to be uh, even more divisive than ever before when it comes to social issues and these very divisive issues that that get talked a lot about in uh, in communities of faith. And, and do you think the prosecutions of a uh, of former president are going to contribute to that? I mean, if, you, if we talked about the 1970s, if, I mean, Richard Nixon and Watergate, it seems so tame <laughs> by comparison now with what the news is all the all the time. Well, what if, if he they, hadn't been pardoned? Right. Well, I mean, well, that's that, that's the big if, right, if Ford had true. not pardoned Nixon. Would there have ultimately been criminal charges against Richard Nixon? There certainly, uh, there certainly might have been. I don't know. And there are those, yeah. including John Dean, who thought at the time, well, this is a good decision by Gerald Ford so that we can all move on and the country can move on, uh, who, now, who have now changed their minds because they now think like that enabled a certain lawlessness when it comes to Donald Trump. I don't know if it will be as divisive because it seems to me like these are just factual matters. You know, when you talk about the 1970s, I mean, one of the reasons why writing about 1977 in All the Demons Are Here was interesting to me is because you had a Democratic president perceived as, as feeble in the White House, perceived as weak in the White House, and a Republican Party kind of trying to figure out what to do next, whether mm -hmm. to move past Richard Nixon and how to move past Richard Nixon. And we're not in that situation. We are, you know, the parallels are there. But in addition, we're not in that situation because, I mean, what if Richard Nixon, he'd already run for two terms, so he couldn't have done it anyway. But what if there was some possibility of Richard Nixon returning? That's where we are right now. Well, in the book you have, you have to, in writing this book, inhabit some very different characters, very different ideas and motivations behind them. It seems to me that's what you have to do every day, uh, doing journalism as well, just in a, in a different way. I heard you once talk about Judaism, your, your spiritual background, as actually being helpful to you in looking at multiple different viewpoints at, at one time. Uh, what, can, what can American Christians learn from American Jews? Well, I wouldn't put it that way. But I'll just tell you, I'm not going to say this is what mm -hmm. Christians should be learning from us. But I'll tell you, so I went to a, a religious school, not a yeshiva. It wasn't Orthodox, but it was grade 6 through 12. And we learned Hebrew and we learned Bible in addition. It was a dual curriculum in addition to English, history, math, et cetera. And what I mean by that, how my faith tradition has helped me as a journalist and also just as a citizen is there's a big tradition of debate. In Judaism. I mean, people have probably heard of the Talmud, but they don't necessarily know what the Talmud is. But the Talmud is made up of different books of rabbis arguing and debating what does this in the Bible mean and how, how should we interpret it? Mm -hmm. And the arguments could get quite fierce. I say rabbis, but some, some of these guys had tremendously huge egos. And uh, these, these, are not, yeah. these are not modest, uh, sweet clergy like yourself, Russell. I mean, these were, these were, these were like superstars <laughs> of, of their day, of the, you know, of the Middle Ages, like having fierce debates about what these things mean. And what, what, what was interesting about that was just establishing a tradition and understanding that argument is not inherently bad. It's actually good. And I mean, polite argument mm. and debates are good. 
And and the other thing is, and just being Jewish and being a, in a minority group, in a religious minority group, is that you, my instinctive reaction to, I'm like, for instance, I remember covering Mitt Romney running in 2008 and 2012, and there was a lot of anti-Mormon prejudice from the uh, mm-hmm. evangelical community against him. And it just, you know, I, I didn't understand it. And it just, it makes you realize that all of our faith traditions to other people from other faiths look weird. All of them do. Yeah. Inherently. I'm not saying that they all are. I'm just saying like a Mormon doesn't necessarily understand what a Muslim believes and a Jew doesn't necessarily understand what a Catholic believes. And, but just having Mm -hmm. an inherent respect for like, look, these are belief systems. And as a journalist and as a human, starting from a position of respecting it. They don't understand my yeah. faith tradition and that's okay. And also, by, and by the way, that also meant that as a Jew, I, I'm not particularly offended when Christians say that non-Christians, including me, are going to hell. That's what your faith tradition teaches. I mean, I, I don't agree, but like, it doesn't offend me. That's yeah. what your faith teaches, not just Jews, yeah. but anybody who hasn't accepted Jesus. But I mean, I, that just also means I start from a position of respect. So yeah. I, I think those are the two main ways that my my faith has has influenced me as a not just as a journalist, but just as a citizen. Just uh, respecting debate and and just having a knee jerk respect for whatever people's faith faiths are. And as a novelist, the book is All the Demons Are Here by Jake Tapper. Check him out uh, on uh, The Lead with Jake Tapper every day. And uh, Jake, thanks so much for taking time. It's to always this conversation. a real pleasure talking to you, Russell. Hopefully we'll have you on the show sometime soon. Thanks. Take care. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host, Russell Moore. Producer, Ashley Hales. Associate producers, Abby Perry and Azure Phelps. Director of Operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Audio engineering is provided by Dan Phelps. Our video producer is Abby Egan. And the theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton.